What makes a good teacher? This is a question that I asked one of our members who is a teacher and I thought that her answer was very, very good and is very much uh, the answer that God would be pleased with. We're here at the Feast of Tabernacles and as Mr. Armstrong told us many times, we are being trained to be leaders and teachers in the wonderful world tomorrow. So we're going to be talking about becoming a teacher today. Let me give you the answer that the lady gave to me when I asked her what makes a good teacher. She said to me, you have to love those you teach and you must want them to succeed. You know, if you think about it, she could have said, well, what makes a good teacher? Uh, They must have a good personality. They must know a lot of things. They must have a, a lot of understanding and knowledge. But if you think about it, God wants us all to have those that we're going to teach in the future. God will want us to have them succeed. And if you think about it, isn't that exactly the way that God wants us to be? That He wants us to succeed? And so He has provided for us the opportunity to learn, to prove, and then to practice the way of life that will lead to true success. So let's consider for a moment what your role is going to be in the kingdom of God. When you were first called, can you remember the incredible amazement that you had when you read scriptures that you'd never read before? Can you remember the experience of God opening your mind to an understanding that you'd never had before? Well, that's what it's going to be like for people in the world tomorrow. But unless we understand how we learnt what we learned then we are not going to be able to teach other people. So let's notice for a moment here a scripture in Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, and we're going to start reading in verse 19. Isaiah chapter 30. This, of course, is a millennial scripture. This is something that we can look forward to in the future. We know that when uh, God inspired the prophet Isaiah to write this, He looked forward into the future. Uh, God saw this time uh, when it was going to be a reality. And so he said to the people of Israel and therefore ultimately the people that will be in the, the kingdom of God in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 19. It says, For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious unto you. At the voice of your cry, when he shall hear it, he will answer you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity, because do you remember, these people are going to have come out of uh, terrible tribulation. Uh, They will have been in uh, concentration camps. They will have uh, gone through terrible experiences. God says, and though you ate the bread of adversity and and the water of affliction, Yet shall not your teachers be removed into a corner any more, but your eye shall see your teachers, and your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk you in it, when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. This is the way. You know, brethren, if you think about it right now, God has been training you in that way. And here at the Feast of Tabernacles, this is an opportunity for us to practice the very way of life that we have been taught. You know, God has taken us uh, 51 weeks of the year we live in the world and then just for this one week of the year, we're taken away to a place with a, with a beautiful setting. Uh, we get to spend our uh, tithes on uh, going to good restaurants. We um, have the opportunity to be with our family Uh, all that time we've left our problems behind we're here at the feast of tabernacles this is our once in a year one week and a day opportunity to really live that way of life you know teaching should be one of the most noble of professions but sadly as i think most of us realize the teaching profession has been degraded and people have sadly lost that understanding of what a wonderful opportunity that it is to teach in God's kingdom those who teach will be afforded great respect and honor 
And when Israel comes out of captivity, they will be eager to learn God's way. After years of oppression and adversity, they will willingly seek the voice of God's teachers. So in the last years of Mr. Armstrong's life, he came to understand one of the most important aspects of our calling. It was not to save ourselves, but to be overwhelmed with a care and a love for others and their calling. The concept of us becoming teachers became one of the most important concepts that he left to us as a legacy. In the living church of God, Mr. Meredith has continued with that legacy and we are in the process of teaching and training new people in God's church people who have come out of this this present evil world and who are already having their lives changed and turned around. Let me quote to you what Mr. Armstrong wrote in his book, Mystery of the Ages, on page 351. He said, The very purpose of the church of this present time is to provide God's training school or teacher's college to train in spiritual knowledge, education, and godly character to supply all the positions at the beginning of the wonderful 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. So let's think for a moment. Are you ready to teach other people? Are you really grasping the vision that God has for each one of us here? This afternoon, I'd like us to think about that. This morning, I'd like us to think about that. And think about a motto that we could apply. Enthuse to achieve. Do you remember what the teacher member said? She said, you have to love those you teach and want them to succeed. So one of the things that we need to be doing in our lives is to be looking for opportunities to teach others, but more importantly, to make sure that what we teach is what we live by. You know, I've talked to many people in the church over the years. You've probably discussed this with people yourselves. And you've had them say something to you like this, oh, I don't want to be a teacher. People think that that's such a big responsibility that they really can't see themselves doing that. Well, frankly, brethren, if you think about it, if we don't want to be a teacher, then we really haven't grasped the vision that God wants us to have. Now, this doesn't mean that every one of us in the millennium is going to be sitting in a classroom or a a schoolroom, you know, day by day. You think about it. You take, for example, a a member of the church here at this time who is uh, working as an engineer. You know, engineering in this world is con is controlled by budgets uh, and so the the engineers who would like to be able to over engineer and over design and, and and make a quality product are constrained by the fact that they've got to do the cheapest job and to be as close as possible to the uh, constraints that uh, engineering principles uh, bring upon them but in the world tomorrow we're going to have the opportunity to make sure that the engineers are given every possible scope to make sure that the job they do will be the very best possible job. And they're going to be able to teach that way of life to the new young people that they're going to be training at that time. We can carry the same principle, of course, across to other aspects of life. Think for a moment what it's going to be like to be in the world tomorrow with young mothers, with young children who will be earnestly desiring to know how they should be properly bringing up their children. You're going to be able to teach them simple principles of hygiene, nutrition, uh, you know, child training. Uh, There are going to be so many opportunities for the mothers who are sitting here in the audience today to be able to teach young mothers and children in the future. You might even have a talent that you don't know at this time that you have. But when God has made you into a spirit being, uh, when you have the, the, the talents that you have greatly magnified and amplified, 
Can you imagine what it's going to be like to be a teacher in God's kingdom? Do you want to see your fellow man overcome sin? Do you want to see them live positive, productive lives, free of cynicism, fear and hostility toward one another? Because frankly, that's why a lot of people are upset and frustrated and fearful today. Well, if you want to see people succeed, then God has got a job for you. And he's got a job for me. You know, I I might just take the opportunity here of saying this. Uh, When I went to Ambassador College years ago, I had no idea that I would really become a minister. But now over the years since uh, I have graduated and was ordained as a minister, the most rewarding possibility that I have to fulfill is that of teaching people. And in the last few years uh, with the telecast and the booklets and the articles and the Bible study course starting to produce such wonderful results, I'm once again back in that day-to-day opportunity of explaining God's truth going through the the basic principles of of conversion and repentance, explaining the whole plan of salvation that God has for mankind. So you can see, brethren, teaching is probably one of the most rewarding careers or you might say professions that anyone could ever be given. So let's notice a few scriptures here that pertain to uh, the, the job that we will be doing. Uh, God's not going to call upon us to do a job that we will not be prepared for, that we will not be equipped for. So let's notice some scriptures, starting in 1 John chapter 3. This is one of my favorite scriptures to do with the the, the kingdom of God, uh, the world tomorrow. It has to do with who we're going to be when we come up in the first resurrection. You know, it... uh, it says in, in God's word that Jesus Christ will descend and, and those who are dead in Christ will rise first and then those who are alive will be gathered up to meet him in the air and we shall all be changed. And that change will be instantaneous. Notice 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we do know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now think for a moment about the resurrected Jesus Christ. You remember the scriptures there in, uh, in the Gospels that talk about the fact that Jesus Christ appeared in the room where the disciples were gathered and was Im- immediately uh, present with them. He didn't come through a door. Uh, he didn't knock on the door and they had to open it for him. He just appeared. But then he was actually able to transform himself into, as it says very clearly, flesh and blood. Now, this is an unusual thing for us to consider. You know, most people think of a a spirit being as being some uh, ethereal, uh, sort of almost um, invisible uh, presence that you might just be able to see a vague outline Uh, you know, like a ghost, as people would say. But no, Jesus Christ was no ghost. Jesus Christ was the powerful spirit being who had created the whole universe, and yet he was able to bring himself down to where he could just relate to to the disciples, comfort them, settle them. And then he said, give me a piece of broiled fish. And they brought a piece of fish to him and he ate it. So this is what it will be like for us. We will have the power of God, the spirit of God, but we will also be able to be manifested in what looks like to anyone else, flesh and blood. In other words, you are going to be able to visit people in their homes and you're going to be able to sit down and have a meal with them. You'll be able to converse. As far as they know at that time, you won't be any different to a human being. And yet, there'll be a huge difference to what we are at this time. Let me show you a scripture here in Isaiah chapter 11. This is a a description of what Jesus Christ 
is really like and what, frankly, we are going to be like because it said there, we just read there in in 1 John, that we shall see him as he is. Let's notice here Isaiah chapter 11, speaking about uh, Jesus Christ, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now you think for a moment, if this is a description of the mind and the nature of Jesus Christ, can you actually see yourself in the future having that same spirit? Let's read it again. Let's notice it says, the spirit of wisdom. Wouldn't you like to have perfect wisdom? The spirit of understanding. Wouldn't you like to have perfect understanding? And the spirit of counsel. Spirit of counsel means that when someone comes to you in God's kingdom and asks you a question, you will not find yourself flat-footed. You will not find yourself in a position where you can't answer them. In fact, what's going to happen is you're going to have the perfect answer. You will have immediately the ability to discern the attitude and the spirit and the intent of that person asking the question. Notice what it says here in the next verse. It says, And shall make him of quick understanding, or you might say of lively understanding. And actually, it's interesting, in the margin it says, of a scent or a smell. In other words, it's like you will have a a, a sense, an ability to discern a, a person's mind. It says, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. Think for a moment, everyone. Isn't that what we tend to judge things by these days, or especially judge other people? By the sight of the eyes, and most assuredly, by the hearing of the ears. No, at that time, you are going to judge with perfect judgment. You are going to have fairness and equity. And let me explain another thing. Because you will have the perfect love of God, you will always approach a person, an imperfect human being, with compassion, with understanding, with patience and long-suffering. It won't be difficult for us to cast our minds back to what it was like to be human. It will be easy for us to have an attitude of humility and of love. Frankly, I think that spirit beings will cry. There'll be tears, tears of joy and tears of sorrow. When we look at the lives of people who have come out of captivity, as they bring their little children and they sit them at your feet and they tell this terrible story of what they've been through, And with compassion and with total empathy, you will listen to them and hear them. And then you're going to be able to give good advice. You're going to be able to explain to a husband how to really love his wife. You're going to be able to explain to a wife how she can honor and respect her husband and teach her children. And over a period of time, you are going to have the opportunity to see that family grow. They might start out in pretty primitive conditions when when they first come out of captivity and you're going to maybe even get out there and help them. You know, lay the bricks on their house. Get your hands dirty. What better way to teach than, you know, with the... um, I was going to say... (laughs) with a little bit of perspiration. Do spirit beings perspire? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But let's see. But certainly you'll be able to come in for that lunchtime meal and sit down with them and they'll ask you questions. And once again, as we said, you'll have the perfect answer. Notice verse 4. It says, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity... For the meek of the earth 
and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. But, notice verse 5, and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. This is that wonderful millennial scripture that we have always had as our motto, you might say, on the on the, uh, the seal of the church in verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall feed them. Where will that little child come from? That little child will come from the home of the people that you have been teaching and that little child will be taught by you. That little child will be taught how to look after their little pets. Now, that pet might be a lion, (laughs) but you understand what I'm saying. What we're talking about here is a wonderful opportunity that is impossible for us to imagine in this age at this time. But it's as true as the rising of tomorrow's sun that these things will occur and will take place. Let's go back a few uh, chapters here to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Here's a a description of what it's going to be like in the world tomorrow. It's really interesting as we read this uh, this section here in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4. It says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, that is the government of God's house, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come you and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And it says, And he will teach us of his ways. Is Jesus Christ going to personally teach every one of them? No. No. Jesus Christ is going to use his government. He's going, to t- he's going to delegate. He's going to give opportunities for people to go out and teach the way of life that they have proven to themselves and that they have already uh, had the opportunity to exercise in this life. Notice what it says. It says that they will come and say, Uh, teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and then it says in verse 4 and he shall judge among the nations and they shall and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks now notice this Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. And the last part's the best. It says, neither shall they learn war anymore. You see, war has to be learned. Soldiers in this day and age have to go off to a military academy where they can learn to fire the latest weapons that have been developed for killing other people. It's the army that is the best equipped, best supplied and best trained that's going to win the war. Well, in God's kingdom, there won't be any military academies any longer. In its place will be agricultural academies where people can learn to plough their fields, develop agriculture in a way that is going to be the very best. And you and I are going to have a part to play in that. Now, I think about it at this time as I'm speaking to you all, and I'm sure that in the Midwest of America and in the areas of Australia where we have farming, uh, maybe in uh, parts of Canada uh, and in Europe, New Zealand, I know in the Philippines where I have the privilege of serving, we have many farmers in the church. Well, those farmers are going to teach people in the world tomorrow how to farm God's way. And we're looking forward to that time. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah chapter 19. 
and read another scripture here that teaches us what our job is going to be. Isaiah chapter 19 and starting in verse 19, it says, In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. This is Isaiah chapter 19 and in verse 19. An altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a saviour. You know, it's interesting, the land of Egypt today is pretty much uh, controlled, or you might say most of the Egyptians are of the Islamic faith, Muslims. Did you know in the Islamic faith, they believe in a Messiah? They don't call him the Messiah, they call him the Mahdi. He is the saviour that they believe will ultimately come and uh, bring, I guess you might say, peace to this earth. It's the same as the Messiah of the Jews, as Jesus Christ as our saviour. Well, look what it does say. It says that the people of Egypt will cry out and it says, He shall send them a saviour and a great one and he shall deliver them. Who will be that saviour and who will be that great one? Jesus Christ, of course. Notice verse 21. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and shall do sacrifice and oblation Yes, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. You know, it's going to be quite hard for some of those people to say, well, this is Jesus Christ. We were told that he was just one of the prophets. And you will then be there. In fact, we'll have uh, people who have been trained specifically to go into some of those countries. You know, I've often wondered why it has been that so many different nationalities over the last 50 years have had the opportunity to uh, move to and live in the Israelitish countries, in the countries of the United States and Canada, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Australia and New Zealand and South Africa. Well, I think most of us realize that God is training people from those countries in His church It's interesting, I passed a a church in Melbourne and a church in Sydney. And frankly, it's like a United Nations. We have Cambodians and Greeks and Italians. We have Latvians and uh, we have people from Holland and from uh, all sorts of places all over the world. Filipinos living in both Sydney and Melbourne. So uh, I'm never far away from the Philippines uh, when I go to my churches in Australia. Well, God's training people in the Philippines at this time. We have 650 members in the church in the Philippines. God's training them to be teachers for the whole of Asia. And in the world tomorrow, they're going to go out there and teach the peoples of China and Japan, of Thailand and other parts of Asia, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, You know, God's training people in Burma right now. We have members right up there in the Chin Hills. We have members across in in Thailand being trained by God. You know, it's, it's really tremendous, isn't it, to be able to grasp the vision of what God is doing. And you and I have a part to play a very real part to play. Let's read on here in verse 22. It says, And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. So here we have a very exciting scripture. In verse 23 it says, In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria. And the Egyptian shall serve with the Assyrians. You know, when Isaiah was writing that, these two countries were enemies. And so 
you know, it would be like us today talking about, uh, let's say, um, you know, the Israelis and the, and the Palestinians or the Iraqis and the, uh, you know, the Americans at this time. Now let's read on in verse 24. It says, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. You know, in the world tomorrow, there will be no longer any racism, no hostility between peoples and nations. Instead of different races looking for the weakness in, the other, uh, in other races and nations, they will look for the strength in the other nation. There will be a mutual respect and honor between people. And do you know what they're going to be able to see? They're going to be able to see that the family of God is made up of many different races and nations. They're going to be able to see that they are all spiritual Israel. And so you and I are going to be a part of that wonderful plan of salvation. Now God is going to restore more than knowledge. He's going to restore true principles. Do you remember that we had as our motto at Ambassador College for years, recapture true values? Well, that's what God is going to do. And he's going to use the people who have been at this time in God's church in the future, carrying out that wonderful uh, plan as teachers. You know, we're going to be joined by another group of people. I don't know whether you've thought about it that much, but at that great resurrection, that first resurrection, when we all come up, we're going to be standing alongside not just the people of this generation, but you're going to be able to look over and there is Daniel. And there's... Mark and James and the Apostle Peter. And they're going, you're going to be able to go along to Bible studies and Sabbath services and hear a sermon given by Noah. Imagine what that would be like. In fact, Noah is going to have certain responsibilities in the wonderful world tomorrow where he will be responsible for the overall training of the nations. If you go back to Genesis chapter 10 where we have the table of the nations, you will find that God separated out 70 different tribes of people from whom all the nations and the tribes of the world have come. And so Noah will have that responsibility of teaching those people. And right now, God is giving opportunities to several people in His church. Uh, Maybe they've just been transferred in their employment to to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Maybe uh, you are working alongside uh, someone in your work of a different race or nation and you're learning to have respect and honor. They're learning from you. But you know what? In the wonderful world tomorrow, God's people are going to be those people who have surrendered their lives in obedience to God. And so that's what we're called upon to do. Now, let's notice now this scripture in Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28 and in verse 16. Notice it says in Isaiah chapter 28 and in verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation stone, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone, cornerstone a sure foundation he that believes shall not make haste judgment also will i lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and the waters shall overflow the hiding place this is a reference to the fact that jesus christ when he returns to this earth is going to have perfect judgment it says that everything, you know, just as, a, just as a builder, just as a stonemason, just as a bricklayer holds a, a plumb bob to make sure that absolutely everything on the vertical is absolutely online, 
And he sets it up with a spirit level so that everything on the horizontal is perfectly level. Notice what it says. Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies. You know, people who have been used to to shading the truth, you know, always telling those uh, little porkies, as people say, little porky pies, those little lies, those little white lies. You know, there won't be white lies, gray lies, black lies, any other lies. There'll be no lies. Lying will be outlawed. And people are going to learn how a whole society can benefit when everyone stops lying. Notice here in uh, uh, verse 23, a beautiful description of what it's going to be like in the country, in the agriculture of that day. Notice Isaiah chapter 28, verse 23. Give you ear and hear my voice. Hearken and hear my speech. Does the plowman plow all day to sow? Does he open and break the clods of his ground? When he has made plain the face thereof, does he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? And for the Filipino brethren, let's also say the rice. Verse 26, for his God does instruct him to discretion and does teach him. Let's read that again, verse 26. For his God does instruct him to discretion and does teach him. Now, what's this got to do with planting wheat, barley, rye and rice? Do you know, I think most of us have already worked out the answer to that question. God told Adam and Eve to take care of the land, to dress it and to keep it. But when they rebelled against God, what did God tell Adam? By the sweat of your brow, you will toil. And so Adam and Eve and Cain and all of mankind, ever since that wrong decision that Adam and Eve made, have been out there sweating taking care of weeds with pesticides, uh, sorry, with herbicides, yeah, and taking care of pests with pesticides. You know, there's been an adversarial approach to agriculture. Too many farmers have, you know, pushed the land, taken more out of it than what they put into it. Notice what it says in verse 26, for his God does instruct him to discretion, to apply discretion in the way that he farms and does teach him now you think about it for a moment you might not be a farmer and you might say well what could I teach farmers well I tell you what you could be able to teach farmers when you go to teach them and on the sabbath days in the in the sermons that you'll be giving you'll be able to teach the give way as opposed to the get way you will teach farmers to apply the land Sabbath so that one year out of seven, they will rest their land. You will teach them proper agricultural principles. You'll make sure that the the fertilizers that the, the animals produced are put back into the soil. Crop rotations will be properly understood. And I'm sure that when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, he's going to bring some principles that we still don't even know about at this time. And we will be marvel, you know, we'll be, we will marvel at those incredible uh, truths that Jesus Christ brings to us. So let's notice here, as it says in verse uh, 27, for the fitches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fitches are beaten out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. Verse 28, it says, Bread corn is bruised because he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with his horsemen. I, I must admit, I'm not, I'm not a farmer. I don't know exactly what, what is being talked about there. But that scripture is going to be read to farmers in the world tomorrow. And they will understand. Verse 29, this also comes forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. 
So you can understand that this all lies ahead for us. You know, people say that we are getting to the point where we are running out of agricultural land, that the population of the earth, which I think at the last time I checked, it was about 6 billion 574 million 362,549 well something like that (laughs) we're at the point where people are starving to death because they don't have enough food in the world tomorrow and you think about it this is going to go for a thousand years and people won't be dying because of you know warfare and and malnutrition and and pestilence So the population is going to grow a lot faster and there will always be enough food for them. In fact, we're going to come to the point, this is interesting, I've been thinking about this. We're going to have to have enough uh, agricultural produce laid aside at the very end of the millennium to feed billions of people that are going to come up in the great white throne judgment instantaneously you know one day the population of the earth might be say 15 20 billion i don't know what it's going to be but let's let's say that and the next day you've got double that number of people and we're going to have to be ready with clothing with food with water well that's what we're training for and you know what's interesting this little church this little flock is being trained for that job right now. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, that such a small group is going to have such a great impact. Do you remember what Jesus Christ said? He said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Now, I'm sure most of you have bought some whole grain mustard. And just think for a moment. How big is a mustard seed? About as big as a pinhead, maybe a little bigger. And yet Jesus Christ said the mustard tree grows into one of the greatest, the biggest trees. Do you realize what a privilege it is to have been called at this time? Do you realize that God is serious about your calling? That you, do, you, do we really realize that we have the opportunity in this life now to... Prepare the reward that Jesus Christ is going to bring with him to give to us. Let's have a look at a scripture in Revelation. This is the very last chapter of Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible, actually, of course. I love this scripture, Revelation chapter 22 and in verse 12. Revelation chapter 22 in verse 12. And behold, Christ said, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. You know, the one thing that we are learning in God's church is that there is no room for people with egos, people who want power to uh, lord it over other people. The type of person that God is looking for is the type of person who's able to see beyond themselves. The person who is mature enough to understand that they can be a part of a team that is literally going to change this world. You and I have been given that opportunity and that chance. So when Jesus Christ comes as King of kings and Lord of lords and as the high priest over a spiritual priesthood, Christ will gather his Levitical priesthood. He's going to restore the tribe of Levi to carry out the functions of the priesthood in a physical way. The whole book of Ezekiel chapters 40 right the way through to the end of the the book uh, deals with this section. But who will teach the priests? Who will teach the physical Levitical priesthood? Well, I think the answer is quite obvious. The spiritual priests of God. You know, 
We will be given two titles, kings and priests, church and state. There will, no be, there will be no separation. Our role will be civil administration as well as spiritual or religious instruction and training. Now, it's really interesting. When you go to the book of Malachi, this is a book that was written as a prophecy to the tribe of Levi. Let's turn back to the book of Malachi. And I'd like you to see a really interesting principle here. Now, remember I said that the physical uh, Levitical priesthood will be restored. But, you know, the spiritual priesthood of Melchizedek will be the ones that teach the Levitical priesthood. So let's have a look at Malachi chapter 2. And I want you to think about this, that you are a teacher in the kingdom of God and one of your jobs will be to teach the physical Levites. And one of the things that you'll be doing, <clears throat> and I don't know what environment it will be, maybe a formal teaching uh, position, you know, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, uh, a school or a college or a university. But I know this one thing, that you will turn to this scripture and you're going to read it with real intensity and with real conviction and with a real purpose. Because you see, the background to this story of Malachi is that the Levitical priesthood had unfortunately lost the, pro the plot. They, 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 they could no longer see what their role was and they had allowed themselves to, you might say, lower their standards. They had they'd started to divorce their wives. They, had, uh, they, had be, they said regarding God's uh, service oh what a weariness it is they weren't zealous and so Malachi wrote here in verse uh, 1 of chapter 2 oh now O oh, you priest this commandment is for you in verse 4 he says and you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you that my covenant might be with Levi says the Lord of hosts do you know what the name Levi means it goes right back to the time when, you remember, uh, uh, Jacob was, uh, he had two wives and, and two uh, concubines. And he was um, fathering several of the, uh, the children that would make up the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the mother of Levi, when she, she had Levi, she said, now I will be joined to my husband. What she didn't realize by calling him joined or Levi she was actually choosing a name that would prophetically describe the role and the job of a Levite, to join God to man. And so the role of a Levite is to be that important person who brings the commandments and the laws of God to the people and instructs them so that they can have a relationship with God. Notice what it says here in verse uh, <clears throat> uh, 4. We'll read that again. It says, And you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. Now notice what Levi was supposed to do and will do in the world tomorrow. Just a little aside here. If you go to the, uh, the book of Ezekiel, <clears throat> it's a really interesting thing. The Levitical priesthood in the world tomorrow uh, will come from one of the, the sons of, uh, of Levi. Uh, the man's name was Zadok, Zadok the priest. He was the priest at the time of David and Solomon. Nathan was the prophet Zadok was the priest. The name Zadok comes from the Hebrew word tzedek, which means righteousness. Now, it says in the book of Ezekiel, if you get a chance to read that, that Zadok's descendants will be the ones that will be reestablished into the priesthood. Now, do you know who one of the uh, members of the family of Zadok was? 
Phineas. Do you remember Phineas? He was the Levite that when the Israelites were in the wilderness, uh, there was this evil man who had decided to uh, take a Midianite woman and he brought her into his tent in front of everyone's view so that they, everyone knew what he was doing. And this prince went into the tent and Phineas became so furious, he took up a javelin and he went into the tent and he skewered these two people and killed them. You know, God said, Phineas, I like your zeal. You know, Phineas's descendant, Zadok, had that zeal. We are, as the future priests of God, to also be zealous. I, I don't want us to go around skewering people with javelins, of course, but you know what I mean. There is something about people who are zealous for God that he is very pleased with. In fact, I don't think you can find anywhere in the Bible where God is critical of zealous people. There's an awful lot of criticism of people who are lukewarm and lethargic and don't take their calling seriously. You know, here at the Feast of Tabernacles, this is an opportunity for us to rekindle the zeal, that first love, that joy, that purpose and, and uh, wonderful zeal, as we can only say, uh, for the world tomorrow. So let's go to Malachi chapter 2 again here. Notice this scripture here in verse 6. <clears throat> I love this one. It says, The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn away many from iniquity. Verse 7, for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Well, we've been called to carry that message and we're doing that with zeal and enthusiasm. You know, there's a really interesting scripture here in Jeremiah chapter 3. Yeah. You know, I'm sure a lot of you over the, the years have uh, seen movies like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, you know, a lot of people talk about or ask the question, we, we wonder where the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is. Well, there's an interesting, interesting scripture here <clears throat> uh, that shows us that it's not going to be necessary to have an Ark of the Covenant. Notice here in Jeremiah 3, and verse 6, it says, <clears throat> The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen that uh, which backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there has played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, Turn you unto me. But she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. So we can see here that, uh, let me just uh, uh, check here this, uh, with this scripture. Oh, sorry, now verse 16 we need to go to. And it shall come to pass, oh, verse 15. God says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, visit it, neither shall that be done any more. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. You know, Jesus Christ will be in Jerusalem. And so there will be no need for the ark of the covenant. So that is the picture from God's word. But what about us? Are we preparing now to become teachers in the world tomorrow? I'd like to give us a few points here that are going to help us to prepare. The first one is teaching begins with ourself. You know, a, a basic principle for teachers is they've got to know more than their students. They've got to be better equipped and better informed than their students. So the key to being a successful teacher is living the way of life that you are going to teach. 
example is the best teacher. Notice Psalm 51. Uh, David, after he had uh, repented of his sins uh, toward God in Psalm 51, prayed this prayer. And it's an interesting prayer because it shows where his focus and his mind was. You know, God called David a man after his own heart. And so here in Psalm 51 verse 4, it says, Against you and you only have I sinned. Verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. Then, he says, then will I teach transgressors their ways. What does that tell us? We can't teach transgressors unless we have repented of our sins. In fact, I'm going to be more specific. In the world tomorrow, when someone comes to talk to you and ask counsel and advice, do you know what you're going to be able to say? You'll shake your head like this. I know what it's like. Oh, no, you can't. You're perfect. You Look at you. You're a spirit being. You wouldn't know what it's like. And without going into details of what your sins actually were, because we don't, we don't do that. We only confess our sins to God. But we can talk about our weaknesses. You would say something like, you know what? The very problem that you are having, I had to battle myself. And the only way that I could overcome was to get on my knees and cry out to God to ask Him to give me the power and the strength to overcome. I remember a particular time I was in a motel room and, you know, I was struggling with this particular problem that I had, my attitude towards my employer. I was not happy with the way I, I thought about him. And I cried out to God, change my heart, God, change my mind. And miraculously, all of those feelings, all of that, that pent-up anger and hostility that I had toward my employer dissipated disappeared, left me. And in its place, I studied God's Word and I went to scriptures that taught me that I should honor and respect my employer, that I should work hard for him as if I was working for Jesus Christ. And do you know what happened? That same employer, six months later, doubled my salary and gave me a promotion. And said to me at the time, I don't know what came over you, but you really changed. You know, if you think about it, brethren, that's what we're doing in the world, this world now. We are training to train people in the world tomorrow. Now think about it also for a moment. <clears throat> God is a, a great being who loves to delegate uh, you think about the, the greatest delegation that God the Father ever gave. He said to the Word, I want you to create the whole universe. And Jesus Christ, the one who became Jesus Christ, went out and He created the sun and the stars and the moon and, and, the, and the galaxies and the whole universe. It was Jesus Christ, or the one who became Jesus Christ, the Word, who did that. It's, it's, and do you know what it says in 1 Corinthians 15? It says that when it's all over, when, when the whole of, of the universe has come under you know, the, the control and the command of the plan of God, Jesus Christ will offer it up to his Father. Well, it's the same principle. In the world tomorrow, Jesus Christ will delegate jobs down to Noah. Uh, we believe that... Um, Joseph will be uh, involved with the finances of, the, of the, the whole world. And then, of course, Noah and Joseph, what are, they going to, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to delegate to other people. And somewhere, God is training you to place you in a specific position, in a specific role in the kingdom of God. And let me explain something. The opportunities that you will have in the world tomorrow are being determined right now 
by how much you respond and I respond to the leadership that is being given to us. So as you learn to submit to authority or, well, let's, let's put that a, a, a little less, um, um, how can I say, autocratically, as we learn to, to work with the principles of, of, uh, of government, so then we are able to uh, um, put into our psyche, into our character, that important principle. So God says, hmm, now I know I can trust this person. In that area, I'm going to be able to send him out further to do more because he's proven himself to be faithful and loyal. Let's say, for example, you've got a problem with, with your temper, with anger. And as you submit that to God and you put that on the shoulders of Jesus Christ, well then, God will be able to trust you as he sends you out knowing that you're not going to, as a spirit being, wreck the universe because you've developed the self-control that you needed to overcome that particular problem. So you can see how specific... This is... What we're talking about here is not just some ethereal, philosophical thing. What I'm trying to do here is to relate your day-to-day life and the problems that you have in life to your future role as a teacher in God's kingdom. The second point that we can think about here is to recognize where you are already teaching others. You might think, well, no, no, I'm not. I'm you know, I don't have a wife or a husband. I don't have a family. You know, I'm, I'm not in control of anyone. You know, when we think about it, we're already teaching now. A life is an example to others, either a good example or a bad one. Now, if you do have children or grandchildren, nephews, nieces, you know, even some of the little children at church, they, they, they watch to see how you conduct yourself at Sabbath services. Uh, just the other day, I was uh, uh, at a spokesman's club uh, here in, uh, at headquarters in, in Charlotte, and uh, Dr. Scott Winnell uh, was giving a lecture uh, to the men in the spokesman's club, and he was talking about a very interesting experience he had. He said that uh, he was visiting with a friend, and... Uh, having dinner and uh, I think the friend had come to their house and uh, Dr. Winnell who was uh, sitting talking to uh, this uh, friend and he had his legs crossed with his hands on his leg and uh, he said his young son was just sitting across and he noticed that his legs were crossed and his hands were just on his leg and without drawing attention to it Dr. Winnell thought I'll move my hands So he moved his hands to a different position. His little son moved his hands to the same position. Dr. Winnale uncrossed his legs and his son uncrossed his legs. Isn't that typical? Our children do mimic us. So if we can use that principle to teach our children right things, good things, then we are already teaching and they're learning. You know, at work... Your example of honesty and humility is noticed. People know that you don't swear or gamble. People know that you try hard not to um, you know, lose your self-control. People notice those things. Some people might not like it because they think you're a goody two-shoes. But at the same time, they will respect you. Notice Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 and verse 14. It says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. What sort of a light are we? Are we the sort of light that people are attracted to? Or are we glaring and, you know, flickering and, uh, and, uh, you know, sort of 
people don't want to, uh, you know, come near the light. Well, that's our choice and our decision. And the last point is this. Teaching is a gift. And it's not wrong to ask God to give you the gift of teaching. Now, I don't mean by that, that as soon as you ask for it, that you go around Sabbath services trying to teach everyone. That's not our goal. That's our role. But as people will ask us questions, as they do see the example, then we are able to teach other people. In fact, let me pose this. Think for a moment of someone in your church who has done an excellent job of training their children. Maybe it's Mrs. Smith and she's in her 60s and she's a grandmother and she's got children and grandchildren and you know that Mrs. Smith and her husband, maybe he's passed on, but you know that they've done a good job. Well, God says that you should go and ask advice and counsel. But, you know, the teaching profession carries high accountability and responsibility. When we send our children to school, we expect the teachers to be moral, self-controlled, impartial, honest and committed to their special calling. In fact, if your children have a teacher that's like that, you should be very grateful. In fact, you know, it's not wrong to ask God uh, to provide the best teachers for your children. Some of you, I know, teach your children at home. And so your children have that opportunity to learn from parents who do love them and are going to be, going to be able to give them that, that special um, training. So God's requirement is for us to become holy even as he is holy. Let me conclude by turning to Mr. Armstrong's last book, Mystery of the Ages. I'm going to read here on pages 270 and 271. It says, The person who says, I will get my salvation alone outside the church is totally deceived. This is not the time when salvation is open to those in Satan's world. Those called now, I repeat emphatically, are not called just for salvation. If you thought that God called you just to save you, you're missing the point. We are called for a special training provided only in God's church. Those in Satan's world cannot train themselves outside of the church for that special calling of being rulers and teachers in God's kingdom when Satan is removed and the world has become God's world. So we can see that we are being trained right now in a teacher's training college, God's church. I'd like us to think about it as we leave from services today and as we talk uh, with one another, as we eat together, to really think about the wonderful opportunity that has been given to us. Let us understand that if we are going to be teachers, we have got to be teachable now.